Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. Linode is sponsoring us this week, and you can check them out at linode.com slash podcast.init and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for your next Python project. We're also sponsored by Rollbar, which is a service for tracking and aggregating your application errors so that you can find and fix the bugs in your project before your users notice they exist. Use the link rollbar.com slash podcast in it to get 90 days and 300,000 errors tracked for free on the bootstrap plan. You can also visit our site at pythonpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. And to help other people find the show, you can leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music and tell your friends and coworkers. We also have a discourse forum where you can find out about upcoming guests, suggest questions, propose show ideas, and follow up with past guests. And your host, as usual, is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing K. Lars Lawn about his career, his art, and his work with Mozilla. Uh, so, Lars, could you please introduce yourself? Well, hi, I'm Lars. Uh, I work for the Mozilla Corporation, and I'm speaking to you today from a yurt on an organic farm in the central va- or Willamette Valley of Oregon. And can you tell us a bit how you got introduced to Python? Well, there's a story behind that, just like there's a story behind everything I do. But I actually must thank Microsoft for leading me to open source software and Python. Back in 1999, there was a dot-com crash. And ironically, I weathered the dot-com crash by opening a dot-com. I uh, started uh, with a nursery uh, selling rose bushes online. And I hadn't done any research ahead of time, and it was turned out that We were the only nursery online in 1999 that had a buy now button. We sold everything we had in the first four hours that we were open. (laughs) But the business was actually really quite successful. And fast forward to 2002, and I got a letter from people called the Business Software Alliance or Association or something like that. And it was a threatening letter telling me that I had uh, pirated software in my business and that they were preparing to sue me. But there was an amnesty program, and if I paid this certain amount of money for all of these licenses for these Microsoft products, they would go away. I was stunned. There were seven computers in my business at that time, and the only software in them was the software that came from Dell and the software that I wrote myself. I, like I said, I was stunned. I didn't know what to do about this. And I, you know, I couldn't find a single one of those certificates of authenticity that came with the machines. So I had, I guess, no way of proving that I owned the software that was on my machines. So after several sleepless nights and pouring over my budget, I realized that I was going to have to lay off an employee in order to afford to pay the amount that I was going to have to pay. I finally decided which person I was going to lay off and then came up with a plan on how I was going to get through an entire shipping season short an employee. And I pulled out that letter and suddenly was shocked by something I hadn't noticed at the beginning. My business name was called The Uncommon Rose. And the salutation on the letter was Dear Ms. Rose Uncommon. What had happened apparently is this business software group had purchased marketing mailing list. And they just spammed everybody with the same message. I realized they knew nothing about my business at all. They didn't know anything. I even had computers. So I realized it was just some sort of protection racket. I took the letter, copied it, sent it to the attorney general's office, explaining what was going on, and uh, then decided to ignore it and decided that Microsoft has no business having their hand in my revenue stream whatsoever. The software had been written entirely using Microsoft C++, uh, the Rogue Wave uh, C++ libraries, Microsoft SQL Server, and various other uh, Microsoft technologies. I decided to eliminate all of it. All the Microsoft keyboards and Microsoft mice went to uh, electronics recycling. I started doing some research. I discovered this language called Python which looked like a very good language to rapidly rewrite the entire software for the business. Uh, I chose the Postgres database and Linux. And in two months, I entirely wrote the entire suite of software that ran the business from the greenhouse management all the way through the website generation. So like I say, I must thank Microsoft for introducing me to Python and open source software. 
It's funny how many times I've heard people say that they came to Python because they had to completely rewrite an existing project in a short matter of time, and then they were surprised by how quickly they were able to actually achieve that. It was amazing. I, I was really, really impressed with the Python language at that point. Having been a C++ programmer for many years, and I started C++ way back in 87, and the whole cycle of writing and testing was an order of magnitude faster. Yeah, having the REPL for being able to do things interactively and in an exploratory manner has really been sort of foundational in how I've approached my programming career. Yep. When I was going through your blog to prepare for this interview, I noticed that you have an interesting pair of articles on your website trying to detail how you perceive code and why you think that code formatting should be able to be configured in a manner similar to CSS. So I'm wondering if you can explain a bit how your particular way that you perceive code affects the ways that you program. Certainly. It is only be recently that I have really come to understand how my brain is different from most of the other programmers that I know. Uh, I have a minor form of what is called a synesthesia. A synesthesia is when uh, certain perceptions are mixed up in the brain. People taste colors and things like that. Well, I see complicated, twisted lines in colors, even if they're not actually done in colors. To me, code is the same sort of idea. I see it in colors. And that became first apparent to me when I was in graduate school. I was in an artificial intelligence class using the language Lisp. The professor was giving some sort of lecture on recursive pattern matching algorithms, and I probably was just doodling uh, and not paying close attention. But I noticed all of a sudden a flash of blue caught my eye, and he was writing on an overhead projector in black ink. And I stopped him and said, wait a minute, uh, there's something wrong with your algorithm here. And then I said something vague about uh, uh, you lose context in the recursion at this point. He smiled at me and said, well, I've been using this example for 10 years and we know it works, et cetera, et cetera. And I backed down. I wasn't going to tell him it's too blue. <laughs> so I backed down and he continued with his lecture. After a few minutes, he suddenly stopped in mid-sentence, scrolled the overhead projector back to that algorithm looked at it for a moment, and then looked at me and grinned and said, nobody has ever caught that problem. I didn't know it was there myself. And ever since then, I can say I can look at code, and if I see something blue, I know there's a problem. I may not know what it is, and it's not always completely reliable. So the way I code is, is kind of unique. I'm very, a very exploratory coder. And I believe very much in being very verbose in writing code. Uh, I believe that a variable name shouldn't be a word. It should be an entire sentence describing what it is. A collection of something. Variable names, such as looping variables, I rarely ever use X or I. I want to say what the object is. And I'm going to use an article in front of it. Uh, a blog post. A integer. Or rather, an integer. Something like that, because then the code to me reads like English sentences. If a blog post is greater in length than, etc. So that's how code looks best to me. If it's written out in long form like that, I can go back to it and read it again. Unfortunately, it doesn't fit with many people's or many organizations' coding standards. And, uh, you know, uh, most of the people I know know never to actually talk to me about PEP 8. <laughs> Because for me, PEP 8 is a disaster. And honestly, it gives all code a bluish cast. It almost blinds me to finding problems in code if I can't use this synesthesia that I have. The main problem, and, and it well, certainly has been addressed in PEP 8, is line length. I have always felt that limiting line length to 79 characters causes you to overload the meaning of white space. It no longer just shows structure. It also shows that you have uh, lines that are too long. And with my variable names being long sentences, almost every line is too long. And so I've had to modify how I, I, I write code. And to me, it becomes far less readable. Wouldn't it be great if we could find a way of looking at code and seeing it in the form of which we can read it the best? 
Now, the only thing I can think of that can do that sort of thing is the same way that HTML is styled in CSS. Uh, I would love to see some way, an editor of some sort, to enable me to format my code in a way that I can read it. And then when someone else looks at it in their editor, it's formatted in the way they can read it most easily. I don't know the feasibility of this. I've sat down and tried to uh, think about how I would program this, played around with a few things, and really didn't get anywhere with it. It may never happen, at least in my lifetime, but it's a great fantasy. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting problem to ponder because, as you said, different people view code differently, and it sounds like your particular form of synesthesia is both your superpower and your kryptonite in that respect. Very true. Yeah, particularly when you're saying, for instance, the long variable names, you know, as far as a CSS system, one potential approach would be to have maybe a long and a short form of the variable so that you could have a toggle that will determine how those render so that people who want shorter line lengths can use the abbreviated form and people who prefer the more expressive variable name can view it in the in its original context. And then once you get to that point, then you want to have, well, the variable in a different language and et cetera like that. And then uh, it becomes impossible to write code at all. Right. And, and, and then you have to deal with I18N before you can even actually write your program. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's an interesting, interesting problem to ponder, at least, if not solve. <laughs> right. I'm curious if the manner in which you perceive complicated expressions has contributed to some of your fascination with complexity theory, which we'll touch on a little bit later, but also your uh, your interest and proficiency in drawing what I must say are quite beautiful mazes. Um, they're certainly quite closely related. Um, do you know of the language called APL? I am familiar with it. I have actually recently listened to a podcast on um, for, for somebody who was very familiar with the language. It was on the Functional Geekery podcast, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I love that language. When I lived on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, I happened to be working for a man who was on the original design team for that language. And we shared a love of it and its complexity and its ability to do an amazing number of things in just very terse and brief uh, statements is very exciting to me. Of course, it doesn't fit well with my long variable name idea, but still, I, I still appreciate it in that respect. So the code that I write I often have a difficult time with the rest of the people on my team because I write code that is complex. To me, many things that are complex are really quite clear. I love recursion. I love multi-threading. They are both make things so much simpler in my mind. But complexity is kind of a bad word in programming today, that there's always this move to move towards simplicity because it's easier code to maintain. But to me, it makes code less interesting. And I often see code simplified to the point of being incorrect, no longer properly modeling what it is you're attempting to model. Because I guess you can say that if the business process that you are attempting to, to model is more complicated then the code you have written, then it's likely wrong. You have taken, let's say, you've discovered that in the business model, there are two cases, X and Y. And you realize in your mind that, wow, these two cases are really very similar, so I'm gonna roll them into one. But the business model didn't get changed, only your program got changed. And I'm gonna say that your program is now wrong because it merged those two cases, but it made the program simpler and perhaps easier to maintain, but it didn't model the business process anymore. Now. Take this on to my interest in mazes. I drew mazes as a kid. I found many programmers or people with, with mathematical backgrounds were very interested in mazes as a kid. I stopped drawing them when I was in high school and just never returned to it until about a year ago when I was in an office depot and I saw that they still make flare pens. That's what I used as a kid to draw mazes. So I bought a set and sat down and immediately started drawing mazes and thought, this was this is amazing. I love this. After drawing about 20 of them, uh, my husband suggested that I try drawing them on a tablet 
instead. And so I got my Android tablet out and, and bought a, 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 a pen for it and started drawing on that. And wow, it was amazing. I could really do some interesting things. And then I realized with these drawing programs, I can do layering and make layer masks and put these things in the colors that I actually see them in in my mind. And from then, all of a sudden, these amazing things started coming out of me. These the represented uh, botanical drawings. And I stunned myself with these things. I've, I've done, I think I finished the 44th one just very recently. Some of them take up to 80 hours to draw. But it's as if maybe perhaps sometime a year ago, it's like I had a stroke or something. And all of a sudden, I have an artistic ability that I never thought I had. It's great to discover something new at age 56. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting story because viewing the images that you produce, you would think that you've been doing it all your life because I must say they're quite astounding and incredibly detailed. They're very therapeutic to draw. I can sit for several hours and just in a mindless state, almost zen-like meditation, draw these things. They're drawn in several stages. I first draw the lines uh, just on a whim, exploring different sorts of patterns. And then I use the feature of drawing programs of flood fill to find out what regions I have made connected lines in. And then I engineer the maze from that using, I guess, my programming skills. <laughs> Maybe I should say I should use my my skills of deceit <laughs> to try and to try and make these uh, mazes as difficult as possible. I don't think I don't know of anyone who has ever solved one of my mazes. I know they all have solutions uh, because I, I prove it to myself before I publish them. I actually had an art show in my little town here in June. It was show, went for a month, and I think for an unknown artist in an obscure gallery in a small town, I did extraordinarily well for selling seven pieces that went for from 350 to 500 dollars each it was amazing perhaps i have a new <laughs> career if i ever get out of this programming stuff yeah if you get tired of slinging code all day you certainly have the talent for it and for anybody who hasn't seen them i I'm going to put a link in the show notes, but, you know, if you look at them from a distance, you would never guess that there's actually a second layer of purpose behind them beyond just visual artwork. And the amount of detail that you can get out of it at the same time as incorporating such complicated mazes is just astounding. And the fact that you start with just sort of an exploratory approach of seeing what sorts of shapes and patterns come about and then using that to then direct the creation of the maze and I'm assuming as well the actual content of the image is pretty remarkable. I decide what the content of the image is going to be ahead of time. I don't just, it doesn't, doesn't spew out just whole. Uh, I said, okay, I'm going to do a poppy here. And now I, I sit and look, I look at a poppy and, and decide that what shapes are interesting and then start drawing them. And playing again on the subject of complexity, at Mozilla, you've helped with the creation and stewardship of a project called Socorro, which you mentioned in your keynote, you utilize some aspects of complexity analysis for being able to correlate the stack traces that you receive into this project. And I'm wondering how you sort of came across or approached that idea of incorporating that sort of level of theoretical application to something like error monitoring. Well, the, uh, the actual use of fractal dimension for categorizing or uh, classification of errors was something that never made it actually into the production code. We built the system over the last 10 years, and it's a complicated, multi-process, multi-threaded uh, application with my signatures all over it. And uh, at the final iteration, before I've left that group, I create what, created what is called the processor as a rule-based system so that classification systems can easily be written and then just plugged into this system at configuration time. And so while writing the uh, keynote, I was thinking about different uses of complexity and I thought, well, you know, or rather fractal dimension, I could write a classification system for Socorro that used fractal dimension. And so I coded it up in just a few minutes and inserted it into my own personal copy of Socorro and then ran uh, a million crashes through it and discovered that I could do some correlations between crashes that the rest of the system hadn't detected that were similar crashes or from the same root cause. But then at that point, you know, I was doing that for the lecture, not for Mozilla. 
Uh, I found some counterexamples where it didn't work as well, where it found some correlations where there were not actual correlations. There may be something to it, uh, but it would take a little bit more work, and I'm not with that group anymore, so it's kind of gone by the wayside. Well, it's still a very interesting application of that kind of uh, analysis, and it, it'll be curious to see if that does evolve further and maybe some of the other areas that it might pop up. Mm -hmm. So can you describe a bit about how the Socorro project is architected and sort of how it works under the covers and maybe what the evolution over time has looked like for it? Certainly. Um, I started on the Socorro project in, I think, 07 or 08, just to before the release of Firefox 3. Uh, it had already been started uh, by some of the platform engineers, and then I was brought on to complete it. And uh, in some ways, it was kind of like after some nuclear disaster and all of the developers were just gone, and all of a sudden the code base was given to me and there was no one to talk to about it or what it was. And the idea was that I had to make it work in a very short order. And of course, Python is really good at that. And so I hacked the thing together to make it work. And it worked mostly, uh, but it was an awful hack. And then for the next few years, we did uh, a group kind of formed around me and we did what I call retroactive forethought. We refactored the code and took the hacks out of it to make it uh, more of an engineered thing rather than something just thrown together. So it consists of several uh, independent parts running on separate machines, uh, a collector, which is just simply, well, at the time was a Python, uh, it was actually a mod Python, I think, running under Apache that uh, uh, catches the crashes as they come in from the field and stores them uh, on disk uh, on the, the webhead. Uh, and then another process takes them off that disk and sends them into uh, long-term storage. At that time, it was another disk and Postgres. And then another process running on several machines uh, pulls them off the disk and out of Postgres and performs a miracle uh, using the Stackwalker and remarries this binary blob of stack information with symbol tables uh, so that... Uh, we can find out exactly what the code was that crashed. And then there's a, uh, a web app in front of that that uh, allows the developers then to go in and look at these crashes, categorize them, look at uh, aggregate information about them, and actually drill down into our source code system to find out exactly what lines and look at the lines of the code. Uh, it's all multi-process, uh, multi-threaded stuff. I went from multi-threaded from the very beginning back in 07 because I love multi-threading. And then over the years, um, I started to do generalizations. One of the things that was most apparent about the project is that it needed to be very quick on its feet for a changing environment. We decided we were going to, in 2010, we decided to move and use HBase to replace the file system storage. And so we built HBase modules and, and linked them into the system. But I wasn't satisfied with that because I knew that we were going to add other things in the future. And so I came up with this library that I call Configman that does dynamic loading of modules in Python so that like connecting Legos together at the configuration time, we can change the front end or back end of this system at will. By the, the climax of this in, well, well, I can't remember, it was four, between 14 and 15, that we had dropped HBase and we're moving all of our data ama to Amazon S3. We were able to put Amazon S3 module in and just tell the applications to SigHub. And so they added Amazon S3 in parallel with HBase without shutting the programs down even. It just reload, reloaded configuration and kept right on running not losing a step, ran that way for a month till we verified that the Amazon S3 and the HBase data was identical, and then rewrote the configuration to take HBase out, sent SIGHUB to all of the uh, applications, HBase was gone. Again, the applications didn't even have to be shut down. That's quite a remarkable feat of engineering. <laughs> um, it, I, I was very proud of it. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, it adds a significant amount of complexity to the system with the added benefit of the flexibility. You know, I say that in my career, any of the software that I hard-coded any external resource, that software is long gone. It had a two-year life at most. But software that I've written that allows 
to have dynamic configuration and dynamic loading of modules, in other words, future-proofing it, it still is running today. I did something similar to this way back in my career in the 1980s in the language Fortran to drive flatbed plotters. A couple years ago, I went back and visited that company that I did this for and found that my Fortran code is still in use 30 years later. Speaking as somebody who hasn't had a technical career anywhere near that length yet, that is my my hat goes off to you, sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> At this year's PyCon US out in Portland, Oregon, you presented the closing keynote, and I have to say that it was one of the most engaging and engrossing presentations that I've ever seen. And I'm wondering where you got the inspiration for that talk, how you conceived of the mixed media approach to it, and as a follow-on to that, how much you had to practice. <laughs> well, there's a story behind this too, and it all re revolves around the regional conference, Pi Tennessee. Uh, about three or four years ago, Pi Tennessee was looking for sponsors. They went to Mozilla, uh, Mozilla sponsored them and they were look, Mozilla was looking for someone to speak. And I happen to have a whole bunch of friends that live in rural Tennessee. And so I just said, I will volunteer to speak and talk about Socorro. And so we arranged it and I spoke at the conference. And of course, you know, it's one of those multi-track things. And I think I had about five people in my audience. And I think the organizers of Pi Tennessee felt kind of bad about that. So the following year, I decided I was just I would submit papers, proposals to Pi Tennessee, and I submitted three proposals. Two very serious, very academic proposals. I think one was about multi-threading and the other one was about configuration. And then I decided I would send in a joke. And so I made a proposal about parallels in software engineering with Baroque music from the 1700s. Well, they called my bluff. <laughs> They rejected the two uh, proposals, the academic ones, and chose the music one. So I had to follow up. And that became my lecture called The Well-Tempered API, uh, subtitled, I can play 300-year-old music, but I can't open a Word document from 1990. <laughs> and uh, it was multimedia. I uh, um, hadn't played a musical instrument since high school. And so I learned to play this uh, electronic woodwind of mine and uh, gave the presentation. There is a couple different recordings of it out there if you want to find it. It's, uh, you can go on to either Air Mozilla or on YouTube and find Well-Tempered API. And, you know, there are a whole bunch of interesting parallels between music and software engineering. I was realized that cooperative multitasking was done by organists in the 1700s. In fact, if you look up uh, Baroque cooperative multitasking in uh, YouTube, you'll find a uh, an excerpt from my original talk at Pi Tennessee that year. Then just as I was, I'd finished that and figured that I was going to be done speaking for a while, the Pi Tennessee people invited me to do the keynote, the opening keynote for uh, this year in 2016. And I decided, well, let's just see how long I can stretch out this music thing. And at that point in at Mozilla, I was getting very frustrated with complexity and the inability of so many of my coworkers to understand my code because it was too complex. And then I decided to demonstrate how, if you don't think about it, Everybody loves complexity. Uh, if you look at a, a soap opera, they constantly, you have these like seven or eight second scenes that constantly jump between storylines. That's cooperative multitasking. And we eat it up in entertainment, but we seem to not like it in programming because it's too complex. And so I made a, a, a talk for their keynote that I called um, Fractal Dimension Music and the art of the left turn. Uh, and that was the genesis of my uh, PyCon keynote, because just like the day before I gave the keynote at Pi Tennessee, I got the invitation to do a keynote at PyCon. And uh, so I modified that talk to become the PyCon keynote. I took out uh, the reference to, to music. I changed a, a whole bunch of things in it. I shortened it a little bit. Uh, I took out some very nice things, I thought, but I only had a certain amount of time to fill. I could, well, as you're finding out in this interview, I can just talk on and on for hours. <laughs> and the idea in the, the presentation was to make a, as complex 
a presentation as I could possibly make, jumping back and forth between stories and yet engage the audience as much as I can. And, and everybody was going to get something different out of it. Everyone was going to notice something different, but there was going to be something for everyone and every skill level in there. When I was uh, invited to do the, the uh, PyCon, uh, I asked uh, Brandon Rhodes about what should I talk about? And he said, talk about motorcycles, talk about mazes, talk about music. And so I said, okay, I'll talk about everything. And that's what I ended up doing. So as for how long did it take me to rehearse all of that? Having the Pi Tennessee experience behind me and doing parts of that presentation, I'd say that I ran through the whole presentation three times ahead of giving it at PyCon. However, the music in there, I practiced to death. <laughs> I, uh, that is the, the most stressful part of the presentation, playing music in front of a whole bunch of people. I am not a professional musician. So I have, I have a high school music education and well, I, like my maze drawing, just a very short time as an adult, uh, playing music. I know very little about music theory, except what I learned for when I wrote the well-tempered API talk. And so that part of the presentation, I rehearsed an awful lot. Still made a lot of mistakes. I can't stand to look at the video of PyCon because I cringe at so many of the errors that I made in the music. Well, speaking as somebody who isn't as uh, adept at musical theory or musical analysis, I thought it was very enjoyable. Thank you. And it seems that you've got a bit of incidental virtuosity in as you uh, continue on in your life, uh, putting a lie to the fact that you can't teach an, an old dog new tricks. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So another part of the presentation that I think tied it all together quite well was the fact that you managed to integrate a rather personal and impactful story as a uh, sort of, it was almost a, a secondary plot throughout the overall presentation as sort of a subtext of complexity. And so I'm wondering what, what inspired you to bring that element of the presentation and mix it in with the complexity analysis and musical presentation and fractal dimensions? It was the realization about how different my own mind is from other people's. I've spent a lot of time in the last year asking people, how do their minds work? What do you think about? How do you program? How do you think? And in the same manner that it has become so evident in the tech world about our lack of diversity, not only in race and gender and gender identity, but there's also a lack of diversity in our own minds. If you are... Um, familiar with uh, the professor, I think at Colorado State University named Temple Grandin. She has given some wonderful TED Talks uh, about the way her mind works. And I think that we very much need to embrace the different ways that people's minds work. We seem to push in software toward a monoculture. We want everyone to code the same way. We want, because it's easier to maintain, we want everyone to think the same way and sit in a cubicle. And there are lots of different ways to live one's life and a lot of different ways that our minds work. So the story of the man that I met in that class who stunned me with his explanation of uh, the recursive partition sort, I wonder what how his mind worked and how he was different from his peers, how he was different from the way my, my mind worked. And then it was such a tragic story that I never found out. And it was during the Pi Tennessee, writing the, the, presenta the keynote presentation for Pi Tennessee, that I got out my copy of that book and discovered the translations of what had been written in there which was just stunning. I had I had no idea. It still brings tears to my eyes to think of how much regret I've had over my whole life and not knowing that the my absolution, so to speak, was in this book that I had been carrying with me for 30 years. Yeah, it's a very it's a very powerful story and I think that it went well along with the presentation that you made with the motorcycle video. <clears throat> mhm. Mm which I thought was well presented, as well as the musical presentation. And it just, it, it blended all together really well. I actually came home from the conference and went to my wife and said, you have to watch this video. <laughs> <laughs> and you put in something for everybody and it really shows. And I've spoken with other people who I went to the conference with and they've said, you know, I, I had to show this presentation to this other person who isn't necessarily technical, but they were still able to appreciate what you put in there. 
Well, I was totally amazed by the, the talk's reception. I knew it was a pretty good talk, but I had no idea that it would uh, be that well received. Plus, I must also say that I am proud of the fact that I can bring that kind of emotion to a group of technical people. <laughs> uh, yes, there were, that th is an achievement in and of itself. <laughs> without violating the code of conduct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So in addition to your extensive technical career, uh, you're also very focused on living in a manner that is sustainable and in tune with the environment and your philosophies. And so I'm wondering what kinds of synergies and conflicts exist between your professional and personal ideals. Well, I get pretty disgusted with the technical world in how much energy and hardware is wasted. Uh, the fact that our computers and our phones get turned over every two years and people who are lower on the economic scale who have old computers because that's all they can afford but they get no support and can't have the levels of security that we have i have some friends who live in rural tennessee uh, who use apple computers that are 10 years old they can't get software updates anymore but it's all they can afford and it really bothers me that we have this stratification of, of technology. Now, as for living sustainably, I live on an organic farm. Uh, I live in a yurt. One does not live in a yurt to be energy efficient because it is just a tent. Uh, fortunately, my climate here is mild and our heating needs are fairly minimal. Uh, but I do like the fact that my home will last many, many, many years and has a significant lower significantly lower footprint than a house does. And at the point that I have to retire one of these tents, the yurts, um, I can repurpose almost everything in it to some other, other use. Um, I've started living in a yurt in 1995. That particular yurt has been retired and there are pieces of it all over the farm serving all sorts of different kinds of duties from the parts that that didn't entirely wear out uh, we run our farm here as uh, essentially an incubator for people who wish to organically farm learn to organically farm uh, we lease the property out for two or three year blocks to optimistic people and they use our property to learn to farm at the end of that three-year period they either graduate and go off and buy their own properties and become farmers or they walk away glad they didn't spend more money learning they're not farmers. And we have uh, actually started at some very successful uh, farm businesses and had some pretty spectacular failures happen here too. And as somebody who is technically inclined, do you have a lot of agricultural automation or any sorts of, I guess, uh, sort of sensor-driven uh, agriculture? Um, not currently. When we were running the Rose Nursery, I sold the Rose, Rose Nursery in 07, fortunately right before the Rose Industry crashed. And uh, I was just then starting to explore using uh, tagging uh, of RFID tagging in plants to help track them in the greenhouses. The system that I used, I, I wrote for the, for the Uncommon Rose in Python, did some pretty amazing things that I still haven't seen reproduced in other nurseries where customers would order plants uh, to have them shipped to somewhere else in the country. And they generally, in the rose industry, plants are ordered in the fall, they're shipped in the spring. The software that I wrote would go out to the websites or the weather websites and scrape data to find out what the conditions would be at the uh, destination locations for shipping. And if the shipping route was likely to have bad weather or the destination was bad weather, uh, it would automatically send an email to the customer suggesting we would like to delay shipment by four days because it's going to be freezing in Denver, the likely route that the plant will travel through in a truck. And our customers loved that. And so we had that kind of sophistication in our operation here. But that's all gone since we don't have the nursery anymore. And the people who are doing farming here aren't particularly interested in that level of technology. Um, they're just trying to get plants to grow in the ground. That's great. Are there any other topics or questions that you think we should cover? Oh, I think we've talked often quite a bit here. Uh, I can't think of anything offhand. I probably will, of course, 10 minutes after we part. But 
I can live with that. <laughs> All right. Well, if you do think of anything else, you can feel free to join our discourse forum and uh, continue the conversation there along with anybody else who cares to partake. Okay. That sounds great. So for anybody who does want to follow what you're up to and keep in touch, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, my website, twobraids.com, T-W-O-B-R-A-I-D-S.com, is where I do my blogging. That's where my portfolio of my art is uh, and most of the stuff I do. I, I tweet on Twitter at twobraids, but it's the digit two, B-R-A-I-D-S. Couldn't get the spelled out to brains. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the poor woman who has that gets a lot of stuff directed to her that was supposed to be directed to me. <laughs> and, and for anybody who isn't familiar with your appearance, can you describe a bit about what the genesis of that name is? Um, back in, well, when I lived on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, my beard is very long down to waist level, and I generally keep it braided in two braids. And, uh, you know, when I was teaching there, um, I, I got to say, I had two types of students, the men and the women. The women would say my name. The men never would say my name. They'd always just call me white guy, two braids. And so I embraced that and took the name two braids. <laughs> That's great. It's a great story to go behind that. All right. So with that, I will move us into the picks. Uh, for my pick today, I'm going to choose Terry Pratchett because he is a wonderful author who has brought a lot of humor into this world and a lot of enjoyment for anybody who has read his books. I'm currently reading his last book that was published posthumously. So for anybody who has never discovered him or who has but has recently forgotten, I definitely recommend taking a look at anything that he's written. And with that, I will pass it to you, Lars. My pick for the day is an old one. I'm going to say Johann Sebastian Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. That's a great piece. If you listen to the fugue, you will hear examples of multi-threading and cooperative multitasking in music. All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join me and tell me about some of your work history and philosophies and uh, the wonderful stories that went into your presentations and everything that you've done. So I appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. It was an honor to talk with you, and have a good evening. <laughs>